our story set in a distant future where interplanetary and intergalactic travel is commonplace for humanity. All of this is thanks to a highly valuable substance known as spice found on a barren planet called Arrakis. The local inhabitants, who call themselves the Freemen, have been brutally oppressed by the Empire and the noble families that have colonized the planet to control the spice supply. For the past few years, House Harkonnen has been in charge of ruling Arrakis, but one day the Emperor orders them to withdraw, and in their place House Atreides takes over the governance. The Harkonnens do not accept this easily and always plan something devious to regain power, eventually receiving orders from the Emperor to annihilate House Atreides. Most of the Atreides family members are killed in the attack, including their leader, Duke Leto, with only Leto's son and wife surviving the massacre. They manage to escape into the desert and encounter the Fremen. Jessica, who is a member of the Bene Gesserit, has foreseen that a savior would come to the Fremen, and many believe that this person is Paul. In one instance, Paul proves himself in a fight, which convinces the Fremen even more, leading them to take Paul and his mother to their hidden refuge. Now, the entire universe believes that House Atreides has been wiped out. As a result, the leader of the Harkonnens, Baron Vladimir, rewards his nephew Raban, who led the attack and successfully completed the mission by reinstating him as the ruler of Arrakis. Meanwhile, Paul continues to hide, especially as he sees Harkonnen ships arriving, but hiding does not mean running away, instead it means preparing for an attack. It turns out that the soldiers were sent by Raban, who, besides managing the spice supply, also received orders from his uncle to eliminate the remaining members of House Atreides. After the battle, the Freemen collect the bodies of the Harkonnen soldiers to extract their bodily fluids. Everyone assumes that Jessica vomited because she was disgusted, but in reality she is pregnant and keeping it a secret. Meanwhile, Raban receives a report about the failure and a suggestion from his advisor to withdraw troops from the Fremen territory due to the danger. Instead of considering it, the cruel man goes into a rage and brutally assaults the advisor. Back with Paul's group, they have reached the Fremen's northern base, where the residents are not pleased to see Paul, suspecting him of being an imperial spy. One of the fierce warriors, Stilgar, immediately tries to convince them that Paul is the chosen one, whom they call Lisan al-Ghaib, but most dismiss his words, except for a few who bow before Paul. <laughs> During a meal, Paul unexpectedly experiences a strange vision and quickly realizes that the food contains spice. Sometime later, Jessica is summoned to witness a ritual where the extracted water from the Harkonnen soldiers is collected in a lake within a cave. Stilgar explains that this is one of thousands of water reservoirs the Fremen have created to help them change the climate on Arrakis. He then explains about a revered elder in the tribe called the Reverend Mother who is dying and needs a successor. To Jessica's shock, Stilgar reveals that she is the chosen successor, as the prophecy foretold that the mother of Lisan al-Ghaib would become the Freeman's reverend mother. Jessica has no choice but to accept, as this concerns the prophecy and her son's safety. Jessica is then taken to another location to meet the dying reverend mother. At this moment, the ritual begins, and Jessica is required to drink the water of life, a highly toxic substance. Because of its extreme toxicity, Jessica is expected to die, but after that, she would be reborn and receive visions. During this ritual, some freemen realize that Jessica is pregnant and declare that the ritual is a mistake. However, a miracle soon occurs. Jessica's rebirth astonishes the Fremen, causing them to split into two factions, one that becomes even more convinced of the prophecy and another that believes it's all just nonsense created by the nobility, as the saviour should have come from the Fremen, not from outsiders. To stop the argument, Paul is forced to take action. He explains that his mother has been trained to neutralise poisons, so there was no miracle involved. He also admits that he has no intention of leading anyone. All he wants is to fight alongside the Fremen. Instead of doubting him, 
the freemen who believe in the prophecy, particularly those from the south, including Stilgar, become even more convinced because Paul's humility aligns with the characteristics of Lisan al-Ghaib. When Jessica awakens, she tells Paul that she can now communicate with the baby she is carrying and suggests that Paul also drink the sacred water. To fully integrate, Paul must learn the Fremen's culture and way of life. Over the next few days, he lives in the desert, learning to travel in a strange manner to avoid the giant sandworms known as Shai Hulud. Noticing a mistake in his steps, a warrior girl joins him to teach him the correct way. She also teaches him many things about the desert and what it means to be a Fremen. As time passes, the two grow closer and eventually fall in love. Meanwhile, Jessica continues to communicate with her unborn child, beginning to devise a plan to change the minds of the forward-thinking Fremen in order to gain their support. A few days later, a group of Harkonnen arrives to harvest spice, and the Freemen prepare by hiding in the sand, emerging at the perfect moment to launch a deadly attack. Paul fights bravely, and his excellent teamwork with Chani makes the battle even more thrilling, eventually leading to the destruction of all the Harkonnen machines. That night, the warriors celebrate their victory, and in this moment, they accept Paul as part of the Fedaikin, the Fremen warriors. Stilgar even gives Paul a warrior name, Paul Muad'Dib Usul. The next day, Paul learns how to ride a Shai Hulud, initially observing Stilgar. Over the following months, he and the warriors manage to destroy more and more harvesting machines, causing significant losses for the Harkonnens. When Vladimir hears of this, he cruelly kills his subordinates out of frustration. Vladimir summons Raban for a discussion, emphasizing that if the failures continue, the Emperor will take over Arrakis to manage spice production. If that happens, Vladimir vows to punish Raban severely. The scene shifts back to Paul, who tells his lover, Chani, about his nightmares, where he follows a woman amidst millions of war victims' corpses. However, Chani dismisses it as merely a side effect of spice exposure. On that day, Paul is to undertake his final test to become a true freeman, riding a Shai Hulud. After some preparation, a Shai Hulud is seen approaching from a distance, but to everyone's shock, it turns out to be much larger than usual. <laughs> Many cheer for Paul's success while others bow, realizing that this event is part of the prophecy. The news of his success spreads quickly, even reaching Jessica. She immediately asks everyone to spread the word and decides to travel south to gather followers. Unfortunately, Paul does not join his mother because he must continue the resistance in the north. Moreover, Paul refuses to be called Lisan al-Ghaib and does not want to give the freemen false hope. Sometime later, a Freeman warrior attack on the Harkonnen Spice Warehouse destroys 80% of the harvest. Enraged, Raban gathers his troops and begins a hunt in the northern region to find the Freeman. Failing to locate them, Raban orders the troops to fire at the rocks, causing a massive explosion. Believing they are safe, Raban and his soldiers leave their aircraft and continue the hunt on foot, unaware that the Freeman warriors are using this to their advantage. Meanwhile, the news of the Freeman warriors and Muad'Dib Usul's actions reaches the Emperor. His daughter, Princess Irulan, advises ignoring the situation to let the conflict escalate into a full-scale war, as sending an assassin to kill Muad'Dib Usul would only inspire the Fremen warriors further. Privately, Irulan meets with Reverend Mother Gaius Helen Mohiam, sharing her suspicion that Muad'Dib Usul is actually Paul. Helen confirms this and insists on keeping it a secret, 
because if the great houses learn about the massacre of House Atreides, the Emperor's throne would be at risk. She also explains the plan to elevate Vladimir's other nephew, Fade, to take control of Arrakis. Meanwhile, Fade is preparing to participate in a fight to celebrate his birthday. Cruelly, he kills several servants to test his new weapon, and one of the servants explains that his opponent is a survivor from House Atreides. Later, during the arena fight, Fade quickly defeats two of his three opponents, while the last one proves to be quite formidable. However, Fade refuses assistance because he wants to fight fairly. It is revealed that the fight was sabotaged by Vladimir to test Fade, who declares that Fade has passed and is now worthy of ruling Arrakis. Vladimir also hints that in the future, Fide might even take over the throne, as he plans to overthrow the Emperor. Next, Fide meets Lady Margot, a member of the Bene Gesserit who has been following him. They engage in conversation until at one point, Margot asks Fide to perform a ritual similar to the one Paul once did. The next day, Margot meets with Helen and Irulan to discuss securing the bloodline. Margot reveals that she is pregnant with Fade's child, as planned. Meanwhile, Fade officially assumes the role of governor of Arrakis, with his main task being to address the Freeman threat. Back on Arrakis, a mysterious group of soldiers arrives and conducts illegal spice harvesting. This prompts the Freeman to take action, activating mines and engaging in battle. To their surprise, one of the members of this mysterious group is Gurney Halleck, Paul's mentor and the war master or general of House Atreides. Paul halts the attack and celebrates the reunion with Gurney. After joining the Freemen as allies, Gurney brings secret information about a weapon of mass destruction owned by House Atreides, which could be used to control the Fremen and exact revenge. Paul is initially opposed to this idea, fearing it could trigger a holy war that would kill millions. However, in order to liberate the planet Arrakis, Paul begins to devise a plan. He then shares this plan with the group and leads them on a journey to the weapons location where only the DNA of Duke Leto's descendants can open the door. Inside, they discover around 90 explosives with nuclear-level power. Meanwhile, Jessica arrives in the south and continues spreading news of Paul's achievements. She also meets with the woman who serves as the Keeper of the Maker, who shows her the source of the Water of Life. Additionally, Jessica forces the Keeper to promise to give the Water of Life to Paul when the time comes, even though it is forbidden. Back with Paul, he awakens from a nightmare only to hear an explosion, the result of an attack by Fide. At the same time, Rabban arrives in a fury because his responsibilities have been taken from him. Fade firmly commands Rabban to submit, even threatening violence because Rabban has shamed their family. The scene then shifts to Fade successfully capturing a Fremen base and taking one of Chani's companions as a prisoner. Unfortunately, the girl refuses to speak or provide any information, so she is cruelly executed. Meanwhile, as Paul's group prepares to return to help their comrades, they receive a message that the Fremen leaders have gathered in the south to discuss the situation. Paul is still hesitant to go there, fearing his visions of a great war, but Stilgar insists that this is the only way for them to survive. Together, they ride a Shai Hulud to the south. Upon arrival at the temple, Paul is presented with the Water of Life, and with the support of everyone, he drinks it without hesitation. Immediately afterward, Paul has a vision of his future sister, who reveals the truth about their family. Just like Jessica, Paul collapses from the poison in the Water of Life. Chani angrily demands that Jessica heal Paul, but Jessica has a different plan and asks Chani to do something to complete the ritual. Everyone watches in submission as Paul is revived, except for Chani who slaps him and then leaves. Paul explains to Jessica his visions of the past and future and reveals that he now knows Jessica is actually Vladimir's daughter. Paul declares that they will fight like the Harkonnens, which marks a regression for him as he begins to act like a ruler. Although Chani tries to convince the council that the prophecy they believe in is a lie that will only worsen the situation, Paul, without hesitation, declares war against the Empire. He even rejects the old rule that to become a leader, he must kill Stilgar, stating that it would be a mistake to sacrifice Stilgar, one of their best warriors. Paul's passionate speech successfully convinces everyone, 
and they bow down to him, accepting him as the Lisan al-Ghaib, the prophesied savior. Paul then dons the Atreides ring once more, declaring himself the leader of Arrakis and promising to fulfill the dreams the freemen have held for so long. The scene then shifts to the emperor, who receives a message from Paul challenging him for the throne. Meanwhile, Helen explains to Irulan that no matter who wins, the emperor will lose the throne, but the royal family can maintain power if Irulan agrees to marry the victor. Later, the emperor and his forces arrive on Arrakis, while Paul coordinates with the Fremen, reminding them to capture the emperor alive. Vladimir, witnessing the emperor's arrival, orders Fade to inform the great houses, and the Harkonnens then greet the emperor, who demands an explanation for the chaos. However, because Vladimir cannot provide a detailed explanation, the Emperor punishes him. At the same time, the Fremen, fully prepared, launch a nuclear strike to destroy the enemy's shields and then immediately attack while riding Shai Hulud. The assault is so powerful that it clears a path for Paul to confront the Emperor directly. There, Paul also finds Vladimir, who is trying to crawl away. Paul addresses him as Grandfather, before killing him in revenge, and then orders the fighters to deliver Vladimir's body to the desert and to capture all enemy soldiers. Hours later, the Fremen declare victory in the battle. Raban tries to flee, but is quickly captured by Gurney, who challenges him to a duel. The next day, Realizing that the ships of the Great Houses are approaching Arrakis, Paul asks Gurney to send a warning, forcing the Great Houses to recognize Paul as the new emperor. This declaration is shocking, especially when Paul announces his intention to marry Princess Irulan, though this does not absolve the emperor of his responsibility for the Atreides massacre. A duel must be fought, with the emperor handing his weapon to Fade to represent him. Paul addresses Fade as cousin, and the battle begins. Initially, Fade nearly defeats Paul and mocks Chani as a slave, which enrages Paul. He quickly recovers and continues the fight, launching an unexpected attack. The Fremen chant Paul's name in gratitude for the victory he has achieved. On the other hand, Irulan has no choice but to accept the marriage to Paul and relinquish her father's throne, a situation that deeply upsets Chani, causing her to leave the room. The film concludes with Paul receiving a report from Gurney that the Great Houses refuse to submit to the new Emperor. As a result, Paul decides to lead the Fremen in seeking their paradise by starting a holy war against the Great Houses. The movie ends with the question of whether Paul will succeed in the holy war and prove the truth of the prophecy, and the film concluded. And that's it for the story series of this film. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to support this channel by subscribe, like and share. See you in the next video. Goodbye.